Let's talk about endotoxins. We said they're usually gram-negative uh, because they are endotoxins rather than exo. They are usually degraded bacterial cell wall products. And uh, a more politically newer name for them would be called LPS because chemically they're all lipopolysaccharides. And they, they start their action by connecting uh, to an antigen on the surface of cells known as CD14, seen on a wide variety of cells. Uh, and uh, that's the beginning of the whole process. If you look at the uh, chart here, and if you look uh, with time on one axis and elevation of compounds on the others, the rapid appearance rise of uh, lipopolysaccharides precedes the development of your two main cytokines, TNF-alpha followed by interleukin-1, always mentioned as the two main controlling cytokines in many types of acute inflammatory response. A little bit later, there's the appearance, uh, a little bit longer, but not as intense for uh, interleukin-6 and interleukin-8. But if you want to look at the sequence of triggering event, by the time your lipopolysaccharides have uh, tapered off, you have a rapid appearance of TNF, tissue necrosis factor, followed by the appearance when TNF is tapering off of interleukin-1. And uh, these are the two main controlling cytokines that we've mentioned several times already. If you want to look at a linear sequence of events in septic shock, and remember, you have to have one before you can have the other. You can't mix these up starts out as systemic vasodilatation or pooling, which by itself should cause hypotension, followed by decreased myocardial contractility, followed by diffuse endothelial activation. And you remember what happens when endothelium is activated. You then have Dr. Jekyll becoming Mr. Hyde, and now you have all kinds of reason for the beginning of uh, coagulation and inflammation like leukocyte adhesion to the endothelium, alveolar damage in the lungs if we're talking about the blood vessels of the lungs, DIC, ultimately multiple vital organ failure, uh, the most and last uh, of which is usually central nervous system and I think you know what happens after that. If you want to look at uh, stages of shock clinical in terms of prognosis and treatment, there's a non-progressive stage, there's a progressive stage, and these are both reversible, although non-progressive is a lot easier to reverse than progressive. Finally, as you might guess, the third stage before death is irreversible, and there's nothing you could do to these patients, so it's usually not worth trying. In the non-progressive stage, you have a variety of compensatory mechanisms that take place, the most important of which is the release of catecholamines to try to pump up or raise that perfusion. And the vital organs are still being perfused. When that fails, you get into a progressive phase of uh, hypoperfusion of vital organs, uh, manifesting itself as oliguria and therefore uh, acidosis because of inadequate tissue perfusion. In the re irreversible phase, uh, the hemodynamic problems are so severe, they really can't be corrected. And it may be a moral, ethical, religious decision as how to differentiate the rever irreversible stages from the former two, so we're not going to go and try to do that. But needless to say, this is the pre-death stage. Uh, if you want to look at the pathology of various organs in shock, you would expect them all to look either infarcted or inflamed or uh, thrombotic or both. Let's talk about multiple organ failure. You know what the vital organs are. You know that there's a subendocardial hemorrhage. Why? Because the uh, perfusion of the subendocardial portion of the myocardium is from blood flow itself. So if that stops, there's subendocardial hemorrhage. When you cut off blood supply to the kidneys, it infarcts, of course, but if you cut it off in a, a total systemic sort of way, the tubules seem to be more selective to necrosis earlier on 
then the glomeruli, so acute tubular necrosis, is extremely common and generally the rule with shock. In the lungs, you have diffuse alveolar damage. Why? Release of uh, cytokines, damage to endothelium, leakage of fluid, and the uh, lungs then look like acute pulmonary edema with leakage of cells and proteins. That's a definition of diffuse alveolar damage, sometimes called adult respiratory distress syndrome. In the GI tract, there's a lot of mucosal hemorrhages because GI mucosa is extremely sensitive to uh, lack of blood flow. And if uh, blood flow fails there, you're going to have hemorrhage as an infarct. Liver necrosis, the same general reason. Why is the liver, liver necrotic? Because it's not being perfused. Last but not least, DIC. Why? simply because in a uh, total body inadequate perfusion, it triggers off uh, endothelium, uh, and we're talking about small uh, blood clots everywhere in the body, of course, most clinically noticeable in the so-called vital organs. Here's DAD. It looks like pulmonary edema with cells and protein, and these are damaged alveolar walls. You can see the pink stuff here is fibrin. We have cells and protein inside of alveoli, the classic picture for ARDS, adult respiratory distress syndrome. If you want to call it acute respiratory distress syndrome, I've heard it acronym that way as well. Uh, more common name diffuse alveolar damage because that's what it is. Here's myocardial necrosis and remember myocardial necrosis can be the cause or the effect of shock. So it doesn't matter but when you have uh, inadequately perfused myocardium you have loss of nuclei as an early light microscopic change and infiltration of uh, neutrophils which you're starting to see here more than you do here in the southwest. Acute tubular necrosis, I think you could say that these glomeruli look pretty viable, but the uh, tubules uh, don't have nuclei, they don't have cellular definition. Some of them do, like here, but here's a large zone that doesn't. This is classical acute tubular necrosis. DIC, you could see fibrin thrombi in the glomeruli here. If you do a fibrin stain, this red stuff, which could be anything, is fairly specific now as representing fibrin. You're getting small fibrin clots and accumulation of other consumable factors like factor VIII, like platelets. And therefore, the uh, serum levels of these uh, things would also be very, very low. Uh, last but not least, let's take a minute, because that's all we have left to talk about clinical linear progression of symptoms in all kinds of shock. Uh, we talked about several different kinds, a lot of mechanisms. Let's talk about the patient now. First symptom, hypotension, followed closely thereafter by tachycardia due to the catecholamines and tachypnea. The skin is warm at first because of the uh, uh, pyrogens that are released in the tissue uh, destruction, followed by a cool skin simply from extreme lack of perfusion. Cyanosis ultimately because of the inadequate oxygenation, renal insufficiency, perhaps due to tubular necrosis, then a uh, term called obtundance, which means basically non-responsiveness, and you know what the last stage would be. Well, thank you. This was a long chapter. I have a couple seconds left. This was uh, chapter four, hemodynamics, and uh, thank you very much.